Good morning and welcome to the sixth Sunday of Easter at St. Stephen's United Church of Christ in Harrisonburg, Virginia. My name is Craig Janey, the pastor here at St. Stephen's. We are grateful that you chose to worship with us this morning. We will continue to hold our services virtually while we monitor the impact of the Phase 1 guidelines to slowly ease the public health restrictions. We have not yet set a date for holding in-person services. Our posture as a church is to love God by being good neighbors and stewards. We care for our community and congregation by staying vigilant and prayerful, by trusting the science and data available to us, and by minding our physical distance. COVID-19 has brought heart-sinking grief to our community. We do not want to add to the pain this pandemic has already wrought by gathering for worship in person too soon. While our church house is closed, the way to God is always open. St. Stephen's is and will remain a beacon of light, hope, and strength. Today's sermon comes from the first letter attributed to Peter, chapter 3, verses 13 through 22, entitled Hope CPA. To prepare for today's sermon, I spoke with a certified public accountant, Now imagine his laughter when I called to ask if he would help me with Sunday's sermon. With any luck, he said, I'll put sermon coach on my year-end evaluation. (laughs) Well, let's hope so, my friend. Let's hope so. Church, let's prepare our hearts for worship with a word of prayer. Our God, as we continue to worship you together at a physical distance from one another, Bless the ties that bind our hearts in Christian love. Though we are apart and how we wish we were not, we ask that you give us patience to be patient, grace to be gracious, kindness to be kind, and hope to be hopeful. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I invite you to turn with me to the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 3. We will read verse 13 and conclude with verse 22. 1 Peter 3, 13 through 22. Hear these words. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which is prefigured, which is prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing, but most importantly, to the doing of God's written words. I'd like to invite the children to come forward for a children's time. Boys and girls, it's your turn to hold the phone or the tablet Maybe adjust the computer or sit a little closer to the television as long as the adults let you. Well, good morning, boys and girls. Do you like to play outside? When I was your age, I loved playing outside. Now, I have a younger brother named Bruce. When we were little, we liked to throw football and frisbees in our backyard. We also liked playing basketball. But our favorite game to play in the backyard was baseball. We played a whole lot of baseball. Now, one Saturday afternoon, we decided to play. Bruce was going to bat first, and I was pitching. 
He got on base a few times. Maybe he scored a run or two. Eventually, it was my turn to bat. And let's just say the game didn't go as planned. Normally, we would cover the basement windows behind home plate with either some wood or a sandbox lid. I guess in our excitement to play, we forgot. And normally, we would play with a wiffle ball or a tennis ball. I guess I probably hit too many home runs. Yeah, right. So this time we were using a t-ball. Not quite as hard as a baseball, but still pretty dense. Do you think you know what happened? <laughs> you could already smell trouble, right? Well, you guessed it. While I was hitting, I foul-tipped a ball that went behind me and right through the basement window. Instead of telling the truth, I told a whopper of a story after I covered the window with the sandbox lid. Later that day, my mother noticed the broken window and asked my dad to investigate. He questioned Bruce and me, but we told the same story, blaming it on our neighbor across the street. Well, Dad wasn't buying it. So when our neighbor stopped by to play basketball, Dad just asked him, Hey, pal, what you been up to? His answer spelled trouble. He was with his mother shopping all day and had just come home. Dad told him that the boys wouldn't be able to play for a while because they were grounded. We should have just told the truth. Today's passage opens with a question and an answer. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Bruce and I were grounded because we didn't tell our parents the truth. And we tried to blame someone who didn't break the window. That day, we were not being good children and we were not being good friends. Do you know what our consequence was for lying? We had to use our allowance money to pay for a new window and help dad fix it. Plus, we couldn't play outside and we also couldn't play video games for a week. Talk about suffering. But we sure learned our lesson. It wasn't the last window we broke, but it was the last time we would lie about breaking a window. Had we just told the truth, we might have received grace instead of so many consequences. Dad might have just bought the window with his own money and probably fixed it by himself. We would still be able to play outside and our friends and, and us, we could all play video games when it rained. But we chose to do something wrong. The Bible is right. It's better to suffer for doing good than to suffer for doing evil, right? Amen. Okay, y'all, will you pray with me as we repeat together? Our God, thank you for always loving us. Help us to do the right things, even when right things are hard to do. Let us tell the truth and be good friends, even if doing so has consequences. Take care of me. Take care of my family, my friends, and my church. Amen. Well, thanks, boys and girls. I'm going to speak to the adults now, but you can always listen in as well. If you have any questions about what I've said or what you've heard, don't ever be afraid to ask. We learn by asking questions. The toughest exam I ever took was also the shortest of course, it had to be systematic theology, and it had to be a cumulative exam. Although our class had an exam review and a take-home study guide, which we subdivided and shared, I was not prepared for the shock that jolted through my body as the class turned over the exam in disbelief. The professor had entered the class with a handful of exams on top of a ream of unopened paper. The exam was three pages stapled together, Two and nine-tenths of those pages were blank. Atop the first page was one question with four words. If God, why evil? The extra printer paper came in handy as the four-hour exam took almost the entire time. I decided that my hand could no longer write, and I turned in the final exam handwritten. The total damage was a little more than eight pages. Four front and back with a paragraph or two on the ninth page. After I finished, I turned it in with some sarcastic remark like, well, 
Here's your answer key. <laughs> to which we both laughed. Some of my classmates and I walked to the cafeteria debriefing so that we could get some ice for our hands. I got an A for the course and eventually a master of divinity, having mastery knowledge of the full body of divinity, as my dean would say. To this day, I don't quite remember all I wrote down, but I am sure that I evolved in some places and may be devolved in others. What I can tell you is that the young man who answered that question is not the same middling man preaching today. He changed. So did the world. Life happened several times. And by life, I mean that euphemism for what Forrest Gump said happens sometimes. Some of you are familiar with life happening and probably wish life were a little more boring. It's not. And here we are in the middle of a viral pandemic and migrating murder hornets looking for a word from God that might provide consolation or encouragement or hope. I want us to focus our attention today to verses 14 through 16a. But even if you do suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear. A driving question for today's passage is what causes us to hope? Or said another way, how do we account for hope? For accounting help, I called my friend Dan, who has more letters after his name than me. He has an MPA, a Master of Public Accountancy. He is a CPA, Certified Public Accountant, and a CFE, Certified Fraud Examiner. If anyone could help me out, and account for hope, and ensure that I could have a clean audit, it was Dan the man. The first thing he tells me is that hope is a terrible accounting strategy. The only time he employs hope is when he hopes that the financials are wrong, especially if the numbers appear in parentheses or the font color on the spreadsheet is red. If hope is a terrible strategy, well, maybe it's a pleasant outcome. Either way, I wasn't about to lose hope for this sermon, so I pressed him to give me an accounting primer, since he also taught adjunctively for a public university. He began his tutorial by going through a set of financials, balance sheet, statement of net assets, income statement, cash. I know what cash is. Prepaid assets, receivables, payables, accruals. It was a bit overwhelming. Thankfully, I took notes and I wrote down this. A business's cash flow statement is where the balance sheet meets the profit and loss statement. The cash flow statement tells you what is funding the business. It could include sales, investments, equity, borrowing, debt, etc. Next, Dan told me about tutoring college students at a coffee shop and that he likes to show them how a basic transaction runs through the financials. We just bought a cup of coffee, so what's involved in making that purchase? I paid for the coffee with cash, which equals revenue for the company, and a cash debit on my balance sheet. We'll credit the revenue, we'll debit the expense, and then they're on to more complicated business models. At that point, he started talking about car dealerships, and my eyes glazed over. But I couldn't quite shake his definition of a cash flow statement. It tells you what is funding the business. Friends, what is funding your hope or what is causing your hope to withdraw or wane? During that conversation, it suddenly hit me. The cause of our hope is explained quite clearly in the Bible. In Romans 5, 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul, who was Saul last week, writes, We also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces fortitude, and fortitude produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. We hope because we suffer. My mentor had a formula he often would like to cite. E plus I equals R. Experience plus interpretation equals revelation. How we face our sufferings and the pressures of life is our in interpretation. Difficult circumstances, sorrow, 
unpopularity, retaliation, illness, and loneliness all press against us at some point, perhaps now more than usual. That pressure, that suffering, it produces grit. Grit is not a passive fake-it-till-you-make-it endurance. Grit is an active face-it-to-make-it endurance. It works to overcome trials and tribulations, grabbing grief by the lapels and holding on for dear life. The work of grit is an earned resilience in therapy, in prayer, exercise, boundaries, deep breathing, devotional time, attorneys and confessional, support meetings and hospital stays, accountability and grace. When we endure sorrows like sea billows roll, it builds our spirit's muscle memory for the inevitable trials we face down the road. Helen Keller, the American author, activist, and lecturer, was the first deaf-blind person to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree. She wrote these poignant words, and I quote, Although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. My optimism then does not rest on the absence of evil, but on a glad belief in the preponderance of good and a willing effort always to cooperate with the good that it may prevail, close quote. Helen Keller was no stranger to suffering, and yet she would not be deterred from a determined hope. When Beethoven was threatened with deafness, a musician's worst nightmare, he said, I will take fate by the throat, and it will never bend me completely to its will. When faced with the prospect of having his other foot amputated as a result of Potts disease, a tuberculosis of the bone, William Ernest Henley wrote the poem Invictus, which is Latin for undefeated or unconquerable. Suffering produces fortitude. Fortitude produces character. Character is the revelation of how we respond to our sufferings. When Fred Rogers was a boy, he would see scary things in the news, and his mother would tell him, Look for the helpers. You will always find people who are willing to help. As Mr. Rogers grew up, he was not just looking for the helpers at a distance. He was helping alongside them. I've seen a lot of helpers in this congregation, more than I can name. Over 500 masks in four days organized with Facebook and a few phone calls. A community feeding that included donating, packing, distributing, and delivering multiple meals, washcloths, and soap organized on an email thread. Six consecutive weekends, starting on Easter Sunday, helping COVID-19 patients in our city with shelter and groceries, providing the gift of music, show, so cherished by our congregation, using remote recordings and learning new technologies on the fly, organized on a group text. Or how about this small act of invincible hope, leaving a printed copy of the songs selected for worship in April and May in my church mailbox. No one escapes suffering. But suffering cannot touch the things that matter most. As we find our new footing and equilibrium in the final weeks of Eastertide, my prayer for you is to hold on to the truth of Scripture, that hope does not and will not disappoint. Hope is not an illusion. Hope is our proverbial cash flow statement. While despair tells us what life runs over, hope tells us what runs our lives. Hope is the outcome of God's love poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Have you seen God's faithfulness before? Well, then trust God's faithfulness again. Lamentations 3.23 reminds us that God's mercies never end. They are new every morning. Zephaniah 3.17 says, God takes great delight in quieting our stressed out lives with his holy love, rejoicing over us with singing. Isaiah 61 is so replete with promises that God binds up the brokenhearted, bestows a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Instead of shame, God's people receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. This week, you may be called to account for the hope that is in you. Don't be afraid of your past, saints. For every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Tell your truth. Testify with your healed scars. And as you lift someone up, be gentle with them and reverent, knowing that where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, he is with you in your midst. This is our sacred trust. We are certified public accountants of hope.
Let us pray. Our God, we are grateful this day for your covenant faithfulness to us. We acknowledge how we have changed over the years, some weathered by adversity, others refined by failures, all of us scathed to some degree, but not succumbed by sufferings, by your Holy Spirit's power. We ask that you lift our spirits again when we feel down, heal our seen and unseen wounds again as you have before, make whole our places of brokenness again, Speak truth to our questions once more. (laughs) Calm our anxieties each time and strengthen us with the familiar hymn. Though trial should come, let your blessed assurance control. For Christ has regarded our helpless estate and has shed his own blood for our souls. We pray for those today who struggle with mental, emotional, or physical stresses. And thank you for turning us to friends in our time of need. We pray for those who wrestle with addictions and thank you for every moment of sobriety and time spent well with family and friends. We pray for those who are unwell and thank you for the constant love and support you provide to us through our families, our friends, our caregivers, our allies, our champions, and our church. Be near us, we pray, as your people. Help us to receive your many gifts with gratitude and faithful stewardship. Hear us now as we offer our deepest needs, our pressing burdens, and our hopes and fears to you in silent prayer. O Lord, attend to these prayers as you see fit letting all creation see your glory and recognize your Son, the risen Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. I pray you'll have a great week this week. And as we close, receive this benediction from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.